Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people, despite I'm competing with the AWS talk. Uh, my name is Tomáš Smetana. I work as an engineering manager for Red Hat in Czech Republic. Uh, I do a bit of technical work from time to time, so I also contribute uh, some code to Kubernetes and other projects. Yeah, you can't hear me. I'm not sure if I can do anything about it, but I'll try to speak loud. Is it better if I speak like this? Okay, <laughs> so just wave the hands if you can't hear me, because I know I talk too softly usually, and if you don't understand, just shout. Um, I work for Red Hat on uh, OpenShift project. That means I have to contribute to Kubernetes as well. Uh, I'm active in the uh, storage SIG group because of my previous uh, engagements. And uh, yeah, started working on Kubernetes about, about a year ago. And I'm not sure if you realize how large project it is. I mean, it's not just a matter of uh, amount of code. It's mostly about the size of the community. If you look around yourself, this, this is a huge uh, conference for one software project. And uh, the community is not only contributing code, there's many users. They run Kubernetes in production. That means they don't want this thing to break. So there's many processes established uh, around Kubernetes. You cannot just... You know, you know, go and change things there. Uh, if you want to contribute to code, how many of you have uh, ever tried to send a patch or contribute patch to Kubernetes? Yeah, so a few of you. So you probably know that it takes some time for the patch to be merged. It has to be tested thoroughly. It has to pass a review. It has to be approved. And depending on which part of Kubernetes you're contributing to, uh, there's only certain people who are mm, allowed to approve a patch. So if you create something slightly bigger that touches more parts of Kubernetes, you have to chase the approvals. You have to convince the community that, yes, this is what you want, and no, it's not going to break anything, really. Um, things get more interesting if you not only fix in bugs, because people want you to fix bugs, but if you are trying to add a new feature to Kubernetes. I think a new feature usually means doing all these things that uh, go against the stability. You create a new API object, or you want to change API. You want to interact with the other objects, and you have to prove that things will not change, that the behavior will not change. So you've got to go to community meetings. You've got to propose the feature. You've got to create formal document that's describing your feature, how will it work, how will it interact with the other objects. You've got to go to the community meetings where they regularly track the progress of the development of the feature. It's very difficult. And my goal was to uh, teach Kubernetes to be able to take uh, snapshots of persistent volumes. So, you know, there's a uh, Persistent volume is basically a disk that your pod can use to store data, and the disk will survive uh, the pod. Once it goes down, the data stays there. And uh, so it's like a normal disk, and uh, people who are using disks on computers, they do things like backups. And snapshot is part of this workflow. You take a snapshot of a disk, and your uh, application can continue, and then you backup the data, for example. One of the use cases for volume snapshots it's a very frequently used feature, so we thought it would be really good if Kubernetes would have an API to take a snapshot of persistent volume, so all the applications could use the same API no matter where they run. So we proposed the feature, and we thought it was simple. It's snapshot, right? Snapshot is basically a tiny thing, and I come from Linux background, so for me, snapshot is lvcreate-s, and there's nothing exciting about it, so I thought it would be simple. All right, so uh, this was the plan. This is how it should look like when you propose a feature. So you present the idea to the community somehow, send a mail to a mailing list, go to a meeting or whatever, create a formal proposal. The proposal has to pass a review. It has to be accepted. 
uh, to the uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, tree. And then, of course, you have to implement the feature. That means the code, again, has to pass uh, the testing, the formal reviews, and it has to be accepted. Then, when the code gets merged, hooray, you can go work on something new, exciting. Uh, so what we did, uh, I thought the uh, snapshot is really easy. So how would you do a snapshot? You just tell the system to take a snapshot. Okay, so with Kubernetes, I would create an object. It's how we talk to Kubernetes. We just declare, I want this. So I, my idea was, user comes, creates a volume snapshot object, and Kubernetes will take a snapshot of the PV that the volume snapshot object references. Simple, easy, would work. Uh, I presented the idea to the community by you know, calling for a meeting. So whoever is interested in developing this feature, please join my conference call that time that day. And it turned out I was right. Uh, snapshot was a very demanded feature according to the attendance of the call. Unfortunately, if you have this many people, they have many ideas, many opinions on how the thing should look like, what should it do, what it should not do. So they ask questions like, would the snapshot object be namespaced or not? Of course it would be, because the user has to be able to do that. So how do I move the snapshot to other namespace then? No idea. I mean, I, I didn't think about that. And then people were asking, like, and how do I stop the application before we start taking the snapshot? <laughs> no idea. I didn't think about that. And do we need that? Can we do that? Can we even do that? Can it be so universal that every application or every, every pod would be able to tell Kubernetes what to do mm, you know, to, to make the snapshot consistent? It's not, not easy. So the first meetings were really dramatic. We were taking notes. Uh, uh, first change we made was that snapshot cannot be just one object. We decided to make it two objects, like PV and PVC, similar. So the object that would the user be able to create or delete would be the volume snapshot object. And somewhere outside of the namespace, like PV, that would be Another object, we call it snapshot data, doesn't matter. And this arrangement would eventually allow us to move snapshots between namespaces because there is some way how to uh, make the non-namespaced object accessible somewhere else. It's a very difficult gymnastic with uh, editing the objects, but it's possible. And that's one of the things that come out from the, from the uh, meetings. Uh, one interesting thing, I work from Czech Republic, that's a Central European time zone. Most of the people that I interacted with at the meetings work from the States or from different time zones. So, you know, we were taking notes. I allowed them to suggest changes. And the meetings looked like, we agreed that we will do this, this, and that. All right, I went home. When I come back in the morning, I opened the document, and there was this big, you know, list of suggested changes. We agreed, we will do this, no, 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 again. So as time progressed, uh, we didn't actually move uh, forward that quickly as I wanted to. And we still didn't write a line of code. We were still talking about the proposal only. So we had to come with some plan B. Uh, how do we do that? How we really give the users the feature and the plan B was, let's not go through this official path of creating a proposal, creating implementation, and have it all reviewed and have it all merged afterwards. Let's do it the other way around. Let's you know, be agile. Create MVP, create the small thing that would take the snapshot, give it to the users and see how they use it, what do they do with that, and if it works for them or not. If it does not, make the changes, and rinse and repeat. And once we are sure we have something the users want, describe it and call it a proposal. 
And then we should be able to get it in the main tree, be sure we have a useful uh, feature, that it works the way users want it, and we would have the code for free because the logic would be basically the same. Uh, so what did we do is obvious, create a custom resource. So we started with external uh, implementation. And here's the awkward part of my presentation because if you've been here before, then you saw all the details of how custom resources are being created, how are they being compiled, how are they being used, uh, how the controller looks like. So I don't know how much into detail could I go, so I will just uh, try to be quick, describe what I consider to be the necessary minimum for you to understand how custom resources work and uh, try to make it uh, somewhat specific, talking about the volume snapshots. Uh, moreover, if you are interested in details, uh, times have changed uh, because we started working on snapshots a few months ago, maybe, maybe longer even, right? And uh, since then, there's many projects using custom resources, custom resource definitions, external controllers. Uh, um, uh, here's one of the examples. There's Kubernetes incubator uh, organization on GitHub where you can see many uh, repositories where you can basically take a look and get some inspiration if you want to want to develop something on your own. I think it's the easiest way, you know, just copy the other code. That's why the open source uh, is so great. So let's do the volume snapshots outside of Kubernetes first. Uh, so, okay, I was too quick. Uh, custom resource. Uh, for those who have not been here before, it's basically a custom data type that you can create. It's like a persistent volume, node, I don't know, pod. These are data types known to uh, API server, in terminology of API server they call kinds. So you create your own kind that's basically unknown uh, to the uh, API server, and you can dynamically add it to API server, register it so it uh, recognizes it, it can store it, it can validate it. That's important thing because uh, the predecessor of uh, custom resource definitions was called uh, third-party resource. Third-party resources had the problem of not being validated by the API server. That's why the change uh, has been uh, introduced. Uh, uh, implementation detail that I consider to be important because it's probably the one constraint of your uh, Mm, new data type. It has to implement the runtime object interface. That means you have to use or you should use the code generators. Again, uh, you might have seen it in the, in the previous pre presentation uh, to get you the necessary methods like deep copy uh, uh, methods for, for your new object. So custom resource is your new data type. Custom resource definition is the built-in API that allows you to register your new data type in the API server and teach it to, to handle it. So you can store your new uh, object on the API server. You can delete your uh, new object on the API server. You can edit it. And uh, that's everything. The uh, custom resource definition usually is being uh, used by the external controllers on startup to register. You don't want to register your new data type manually. So usually it's the new controller that basically on a startup registers the new data type. Again, you've seen it in the previous presentation and I bet you would see it in the following ones too because it's how these things work. Uh, this is our volume snapshot data type. This is piece of uh, Golang code. It's snippet. Don't try to compile it. It's just taken from the uh, mm, snapshot controller. So mm, there's nothing interesting in there. You've seen before, uh, we defined some uh, uh, strings that would uh, allow you to access the data types. So the plural is volume snapshots. When you do uh, kubectl get volume snapshots, the API server knows it should retrieve this. And you also uh, give it a group name and version. Uh, so it's, I don't know, positioned well, so accessible. The data type or the kind is again, if you know how the 
PV or PVC look like. Uh, this is exactly that. We, we got inspired by it. So there is some spec which uh, says how I want my snapshot to look like, which is the desired state. There is the status which describes what is the current state of the object. And Kubernetes, or your new controller, makes some action to make the desired state uh, uh, and um, current state equal. That's it. This is the uh, custom resource definition. Again, uh, it should be quite uh, self-explanatory. You just uh, specify what I want uh, the uh, custom resource to look like. So what is its uh, API group name? What is its API version? Uh, there is a scope. So for the uh, volume uh, snapshot, I said we decided to make it a namespace. So the scope is uh, namespace scoped. And uh, again, names, plural, kind. Again, it should be self-explanatory. And now we have it. If we register this uh, in the API server, the API server is able to store, or delete, validate the new objects. But it's not very useful on its own, because you will store your object, you will retrieve your object, but we want something to take action when you create the object. Uh, that's why you have to write the external controller. This is the biggest uh, part of, of the code. So controller talks to the API server and watches for changes on the objects. Again, I repeat what my predecessor has already shown you in great detail and great presentation. So you just register your handlers for mm, addition of objects. Uh, updates of objects, deletions of objects, and your controller is then can act. So for example, if, a, if the user creates a new volume snapshot object, the controller sees that, talks to the backend, tells it, create the snapshot, talks back to the, or gets from the backend some status like, okay, I've started, so it updates the object. Once the snapshot is taken, it updates the object with, uh, success, and uh, that's how it basically works. Uh, the difficult part is that uh, no one takes care uh, of the object interactions for you. You have to be careful with the races, so what happens if somebody deletes the volume snapshot before it's actually taken on the back end and all the corner cases, they're up to you. Also, uh, the controller is usually the part that takes care about registering the uh, custom resource definition in the API server, so the users don't have to do that manually, or you don't have to do something just too difficult. And now, uh, snippets of code that I consider to be, again, the important ones. So you get the client set. Again, uh, that's uh, the thing that the code generator uh, creates for you. Uh, Client set uh, talks uh, uh, to the API server and creates the custom resource definition. This is a polling routine that waits for the customs, custom resource to be available in the API server so we can start using it. Once the custom resource is available, we install the handlers again. We need just the REST client, the scheme, so we can access the objects and we can go to the, to the API server and install the handlers. So this is just the uh, okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, syntactic sugar around it, but the gist of it is this. You say that my SC on snapshot add is the addition handler on snapshot update, and there's basically nothing. Mm, Nothing complicated, and that's, that's the point of it. It's, it's really simple. If you want to create a simple controller that would do something for you, that would act on some of your uh, new object changes, it's really easy. And again, in the previous talk, you might have seen it in great detail with demos. Uh, so, advantages. For us, 
Because I'm talking about not extending the Kubernetes with external things. Mind you, our goal is still to eventually get the uh, feature in Kubernetes, to get it in tree. Uh, but now we are not bound to the Kubernetes development cycle. We can, we can, we can change our code uh, as we want it. We can say to the users that this is an experimental feature, something that you don't see in Kubernetes or you don't want the Kubernetes or is more difficult to implement inside of Kubernetes. We can make the changes. We can make them whenever we want. Uh, we can make a deep changes. We can rewrite it as, uh, completely and uh, you know, be more agile. That's, that's probably the point of why we think, or why I think, uh, this is the uh, mm, good way or mm, easiest way of, of getting uh, features like this into Kubernetes. If you, can, if you have something that isolated, then today I probably wouldn't go the, the path we, we started with. I, I wouldn't start with uh, the community meetings and formal proposals. I would really try it out myself and show the code to the others first and tell them, see, I have this and it works. Is it useful for you? Yes, no, if no, change redo, and it would be much, much faster, and we would be talking about a specific, concrete, real thing. I believe this is important. This is, this is what I really like about the CRDs is that it's, it's so easy. It's so easy to create something on my own, something that works, and something I can show. Um, there's Obviously, some disadvantages. Uh, what I found in our code, maybe it's because we, we don't have it right, but uh, I believe it's a consequence of having an external controller. You don't have things like shared informers because there's nothing to share them with because it's your own tiny piece and it has to talk to the API server and the API calls is basically the only way you can, you can interact with Kubernetes. So the API calls might be more, my needs to be more frequent, and this might be somewhat uh, less uh, performant than it would have been if it would have been implemented in the uh, Kubernetes itself. But what's uh, more hmm, problematic is uh, this is not what the user gets with Kubernetes. If they install Kubernetes, if they hmm, you know, do the hack local cluster up, it's not there. So you also have to take care about uh, deployments or good documentation of the deployments for the users, for the admins. Um, Role-based uh, role access control, again, this is something that uh, you don't have uh, some, any access control by default like in Kubernetes. And depending on how is the cluster set up, uh, the uh, Access control might slightly change, so you have to really uh, be more verbose in the documentation, tell your users how to do that. Also, uh, that turns you into a release engineer and a package maintainer, because you have to take care about updating your upstream images. You should really uh, do some marketing around your project, because it's not in Kubernetes, it's not so closely watched, so you must make sure that uh, people really know what you're doing and that they will test because it's the point of doing that. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, this non-technical part is actually the most difficult one when, when you try to take this path. You really quickly get some working code, but getting that code to the users is uh, not so easy, at least not for me. Uh, another thing we're running into is the dependencies. Vendoring in Golang I don't know if you've seen that. It might become really, really difficult because there's dependency circles. And now you depend on Kubernetes, which is large. And once the Kubernetes, once Kubernetes uh, dependencies changes somehow, change somehow, you got to reflect it in your code. So we spend a lot of time fighting with Glide and updating the vendoring uh, directory. Um, again, um, <laughs> this is something that I hope somebody 
will eventually solve in the future because I don't think it's bearable. Uh, yeah, I've talked about less of your visibility for potential users and contributors. So one more thing that I'm seriously afraid of is because Snapshot is such a cool feature, I'm not sure somebody else in the world is not developing it uh, in parallel. Uh, that's the thing that you would probably avoid if you would do it right away in, in Kubernetes. So it's, it's like, it's mostly a social thing. You know, if, if it's this big project, somebody else would, would see that and join you. If you're developing it in isolation somewhere else, it's pretty possible that there will be splitting forces. I don't know. I hope that nobody else is working on snapshots. If you know someone who's working on snapshots, let me know. Uh, so. We're getting uh, to the end of my presentation, so just sum it up. Uh, CRDs are really, really easy way on how to uh, uh, extend Kubernetes, and that's why I think they're really great way of experimenting with Kubernetes. If you know that your feature is well isolated, then there's basically no reason to start with forking Kubernetes and changing, changing Kubernetes code itself. You can do it with uh, custom resource definitions with external controllers, and uh, then try to merge it back in Kubernetes. And one more thing, if you've heard the keynotes in the morning, uh, people talk about slimming down Kubernetes. Much of uh, the functionality that's now part of the Kubernetes itself is going to get external anyway. So if they, they if we decide not to merge uh, my new feature in Kubernetes itself, there's no problem. I still have not failed. I have it as an external component, same as many other features that eventually will exist in Kubernetes in the future. So this is basically a way how you can uh, ensure that you don't fail or not fail that easily. It lowers the probability of failure and uh, I still hope eventually we get uh, volume snapshots in Kubernetes, but if not, they exist, you can use them, and if you've been to OpenShift Commons yesterday, they are going to be tech preview in the next OpenShift release, so we're looking forward for some feedback. And I think it's the end. How much time do we have? Okay, we have some seven minutes left for, for questions, so first question, please. Uh, yes. Yes. I agree. Uh, thing is, uh, this is actually quite old. So I think the work on snapshots uh, is older than than the uh, aggregator. That's why. Yeah, aggregator was released in 1.7, I think. Yeah, we started at the end of 1.6, I think. It's we actually started with third-party resources and uh, changed that later. So yeah, uh, there was a comment that we can use uh, the API aggregator and it would be also working. This is high level, close to the code. Yes, it's true. You might have used that. Uh, other questions? Yes? Do you have the snapshot controller somewhere in GitHub? Uh, uh, sure, snapshot controller is on the GitHub. It's in the Kubernetes incubator repository. If you want to take a look, you might. I've built uh, images on Quay, so it should be easy to deploy it and there's some documentation. Uh, mind you, it's still, hmm, it's still very alpha, beta quality, so it might be unstable. It works for Amazon, it works for GCEPD, it works for HostPath, and we have new patches for Cinder, uh, that's uh, OpenStack, and we have patches for Gluster. But these are very new, so be careful, please. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, you're in the open. So. Yeah, we, we do this, but okay. again. I mean, it comes still to you guys by the community. <laughs> That's right. So, 
where do you draw the line on whether, if, when you have a new feature, um, to do it as an external uh, standing with CRDs and aggregator uh, rather than submitting, doing the actual formal proposal like the traditional way? Like, where is that drawing line? Because it looks like for me, if I have a new feature, oh, let's do it this way and I don't want to waste time with it. Uh -huh. Again, uh, we think this is uh, some something like a persistent volume. It belongs to volumes. So if you have persistent volumes, you should be able to take snapshot. For me, it's actually quite core feature. That's why I want to have it in tree. And it's up to the uh, maintainers and community to tell me whether I'm right or wrong. So um, my plan is to really show them that it's this useful, it does these things, do you want to have them uh, in three? And if they say yes, I'll work on merging it. If they say no, OK, this is the official snapshots now. All right, are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, custom resources can be. Uh, you can create uh, roles uh, that would basically define access uh, control for uh, custom resources as well. Custom resources in this manner, they behave like standard API object that already exist in the API server, so you can define role-based access even to CRDs. Some more questions? All right. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>